And the other thing that I think is really important to show is that um, that we're flawed too, that yes, we all yes, have, yes, that yes. we're human yeah. and that we all have flaws. And that's a really important thing to show that that doesn't mean that you're any less of a good doctor, that it means that we struggle with the same things that everyone struggles with. That's right. With. Fear stops us from achieving our true greatness. Are you a professional woman who is feeling stuck, unmotivated, or burned out? Are you worried about your wellness? Are you letting fear stop you from crushing your goals? If you answered yes to any or all of these, then this is the podcast for you. Dr. Charmaine Gregory, night shift emergency physician, burnout thriver, and wellness champion, along with everyday heroes just like you, will explore how to face fear in our lives and emerge victoriously. Hey, thanks for checking out this episode. Be sure to click the subscribe button and the notification bell so you get notified when the next video comes out. It only takes two seconds to make two clicks. So let's do it. Let's get back to the video. Hello, 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 Fearless Freedom Tribe. This is Dr. G and we are back for another exciting episode of Fearless Freedom with Dr. G. Today, all the way from Arizona, we have Sandra Miller. So Sandra, you got to tell everybody about who you are and what you're up to. Okay, well, I am a retired family physician. And what I'm up to now, which is very different than what I've been up to all my life. Um, and that's, that's a lot of my journey is about remaking oneself. Because what I'm up to now is writing novels about women physicians. It turns out there really aren't many novels about women physicians. There are, there's quite a robust literature in CSI in crime scene, where you have the, uh, the pathologist, the, the forensic pathologist who often is a beautiful woman um, and who's making these wonderful diagnoses. Not very realistic, but very entertaining. Tess Gerritsen, who started that whole trend, I think some decades ago is an internist. And I think she started writing her novels, her crime novels uh, during maternity leave. That's when she nice. got started on it. So it's a great nice. little history on her and she's still producing. And then she got into film, her books got into film. So she's quite a success story. But I wanted to write novels about kind of the realistic everyday woman physician. Um, most, most film, most books about physicians these days uh, are, are associated more with the really exciting, like in the hospital, in the emergency room. Um, you know, there's ER. I mean, what a, yeah, what yeah. a great story that was. Um, things that are a little bit more adrenaline fueled, surgeons, that sort of thing. There's almost, there's very little about a family physician um, and just kind of what that life is like. And that's, that's what I wanted to depict because that was my, my career and um, wanted to show what that's like. But remarkably, there's very little fiction being written about doctors right now at all. Um, when was the last big book about doctors? Abraham Vergesi has wrote Cutting for Stone, but that's been like 10 years ago. And um, yeah, I'm just thinking because even I'm just thinking about um, well, I forgot what her book was called, but she's um, she's an internist in, from Michigan who became a patient and she wrote her story. But it was also not really fiction. So right. I, I got what you're saying. Like, you know, we have had memoirs put out there and we've had like, um, you know, kind of collective like stories, but right. not fiction so yeah no that's uh yeah that's a so, different point and, yeah and I have found that fiction is just more delightful to write for me personally because um maybe because my life wasn't dramatic enough to try to make a story out of it I don't know but um but I think that it just gives you a lot more leeway and it's more liberating to be able to make up stories and you can do conglomerates of characters you know you can think about all the people both doctors and patients who maybe you didn't Absolutely. like and you wrap them up into a character and the ones who you admire, you can wrap them, but you can change yes. them and alter them. And, um, and the other thing that I think is really important to show is that, um, that we're flawed too, that yes. we all yes. have, that yes. we're human yeah. and that we all have flaws. And that's a really important thing to show that that doesn't mean that you're any less of a good doctor, that it means that we struggle with the same things that 
everyone struggles. That's right. That's right. And a lot of people have the physician on a pedestal. And I actually got a comment on uh, one of my book reviews. I think it was on Amazon or Goodreads or something uh, where the reader said, I don't know about this doctor. She seems kind of weak because what? my doctor, <laughs> this was my series about the woman doctor at the Grand Canyon Clinic. There's actually an outpatient medical clinic on the South Rim of the Grand Canyon. A lot of people don't know that it's been there for okay. decades. And, um, and my doctor goes there and she, she uh, works there and, but she has an anxiety disorder. Okay. Which she's been in treatment. She's doing pretty well, but, but she still struggles with it sometimes. And so this reader thought like, well, that doesn't seem like a good doctor. Oh and my the, gosh. <laughs> she's too human. She can't be good. That, that's right. And, and one of the things people don't realize is that physicians have exactly the same percentage of addiction, of depression, of anxiety, of, of everything. We're, we're not special in that sense. Um, right. We have the same percentage as everyone else. Um, so true. And, and, and so it's good to see how people manage that and, and still manage their medical career and, and do it right. And of course, I have bad doctors in them too. <laughs> <laughs> And there's good patients and there's bad patients. Oh, of course. Wrong. Like, <laughs> like that's so real world. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how do doctors handle romance? You know? Oh yeah. That can get a little, that could be a little sticky wicked, like depending on what kind of doctor you are. Right. Because like, Absolutely. what of the doctor that's always in the hospital, like the surgeons or, you know, the intensivists, like what are those people? Like, when do they have time for romance? That's and right. what happens when they have romance within the hospital? That or gets a little that. tricky, right? Or with someone who is in a different um, department or even the same department or someone who is at the same level of profession or, you know, maybe ancillary to your profession. It, it sounds like tricky. you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it gets tricky. I don't have any personal experience with that, but I do know of people who have. And I could see how it can get a little delicate. Or, or when, when you find yourself attracted to a patient or a patient is attracted to you and yes. you're not, you know, you're not wanting that, but to. yeah, it's yeah. there. Um, and, uh, and, and so how do you handle that? Doctors actually are not very well trained to handle that. True. Um, and, uh, and it can be a source of tremendous stress to physicians. Um, Absolutely. You know, when either they find themselves attracted to a patient or a patient attracted to them. And um, how do you rise above that? Um, and so I like to address a lot of these things because they're fun, because they're interesting and because they're real. Um, and uh, and this, this, I mean, if you're writing books at the Grand Canyon, there's adventure, obviously. Um, the book that I wrote that just came out this fall, which takes place in downtown Phoenix, the title is Where No One Should Live, which obviously makes sense uh, for Phoenix. <laughs> Oh really? Uh, people know. Uh, people know that people can relate. Like, okay, so so as a person who has only visited Phoenix and literally, like, we went into Phoenix and we literally went to the Children's Museum while visiting our cousins. Like, that was the uh, extent of our of our like um, wandering of Phoenix. So well, I'm curious if that if that statement or that little phraseology is something that people from Phoenix would be able to immediately identify with. Or if well, there's more to the story, I guess I'm trying to understand that part. They would because this novel takes place during the summer. Got it. Okay, so, I see. I see. So, so I see. that's why. And and there are several times where the main protagonist, who is a public health physician, that's that's her chosen career. And interestingly, okay. I finished I finished this novel right before COVID started. So oh, here, wow. I've written a novel about a public health physician that's that came out during the pandemic that's not about the pandemic got because it because the turnaround time for writing a novel is at least two years right um, yeah 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 Absolutely. and so there you go um but uh and so there's a couple places in the novel where the the main character she's saying like why does anyone live here you know oh i see <laughs> she's trying to get through the summer and actually it's a little bit of riff um, on an Edward Abbey. I don't know if you're familiar with Edward Abbey. He was a naturalist um, some decades ago uh, who, who lived and worked in the Southwest. And he said, there's exactly the right amount of water in the desert, as long as no one builds a city where no city should be. And Ooh. so my title is also a little bit of a... <laughs> 
<laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> Wowzer. Okay. 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 That's, that's interesting. That's interesting. Wow. So that's awesome. So the book, you just released it and it's yes. available on every, like all of the, the platforms or should be. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I didn't yeah. know if people were just mainly going Amazon or if they, or if you, or they're going through your website or, you know, that's, that's what I was asking. How, yeah, how no, was it being um, distributed? I mean, it, yeah. It's, it's on Amazon is on the Barnes and Noble website. It's on, um, you know, the Apple books, you know, pretty much all of that. My publisher, which I, is a university publisher, University of Nevada Press. They don't publish much fiction because it's a university okay. press, but right. they were interested in fiction about the Southwest. Oh, nice. And, and so I had good timing, I think. And the fact that you know, there's an intellectual component to my adventure and romance and all of that that's going on. I think I also am writing the only novels that have references, medical references in the back. I actually have, you know, that says like where I got my sources. This is where I learned about the plague. This is where I learned about, you know, so that people know, I think it's really important to me that people know the medicine in these novels is absolutely accurate. No, uh, unless something has changed between when I wrote it. Right. Sure. Which I mean, it's a, it's a constantly evolving um, area. So that's, uh, that's kind absolutely. of expected. <laughs> oh man. Oh no, that's good. That's really good. So, you know, so basically what you're saying is that, you know, you are hitting a pain point that's really pretty fresh because you have, um, you are depicting medically accurate, which sometimes if the book is not written by somebody who not just medical background, but like truly have practiced or, you know, been close to the practice, they don't always depict how it actually is, unless they do like a, a lot of shadowing or a lot of deep research. Right. right? Um, so getting the medicine to be accurate is very important. So and, and, thank you for that. <laughs> and also, what does it feel like when you make a mistake? What does it feel like? Yeah. How, you know, what does that feel like in your heart and in your brain when you missed something? And mm -hmm. the doubts that you have, like, would everybody have missed that? Or was it just me? If somebody else had seen that patient, would they have done better? And, and how do you move past that? Um, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, you know, that's why it's such an exhausting job. Yes. You know, yes. Because you're often in that position. Um, now, go ahead. Now, I wonder as, as we're talking about that, um, uh, acknowledgement of being fallible, right? right. Uh, and then how do you how do you reconcile that with the whole, you know, uh, promise that you made at the beginning of doing no harm, even if that harm is not intentional, right? So, so, right. so then you're like, okay, well, you know, I, that was not my intention, my inten intention was always to make sure that I did my very best for the patient. And then it turns out that even despite that effort, something was missed or a mistake was made and maybe there may or may not have been harm to the patient, but it affects you as a person providing the care. Absolutely. So, yeah. so, so in a, in a tigenous society though, that is a, that is a, like, there's another layer to that, right? So there's the mental layer for you as a person caring for the patient and your promise that you made, because you don't want to break that promise. And you also don't want anything to happen to your patient. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is, in a litigious society, there's additional pressures to be perfect, which we all know that's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> right. The, um, the, the novel that I have coming out next fall actually has some malpractice cases in it. Um, oh, that's interesting. And, and there's some discussion. I actually uh, have a friend who is a malpractice lawyer. She and I kind of got to know each other when I was asked to look at the case. Um, and, uh, so she was my advisor for some of the cases, this novel coming out next fall, I'm really excited about because it's about a middle-aged physician who okay. is, about, she's 58 and she's very burnt out. She's kind of depressed. She's had a very bad year and she's thinking of leaving medicine early, not waiting until retirement age. And she's giving herself one more year to see if she can pull it together and get back to enjoying her medical career. Otherwise she's going to retire early. And I'm, and that one's going to be in first person. 
Okay. All right. Awesome. And, and here, here, here's an idea for you. Uh, yeah. Maybe this is the next one. Yeah. Um, it would be interesting to do one because, so you mentioned retirement age and I would say that in medicine, that age is a lot younger than the typical retirement age. So I don't know if you want to address that because there are more and more physicians who are basically looking at themselves as like a 20 year bid in medicine, you know, they get done and they're like 20 years and they're done, you know, um, because of a lot of reasons. And so I don't know if you have thought about that as a possible, Um, you know, avenue. Um, but the younger physician who, um, either, either they already have like a plan for that amount of time in medicine, mm-hmm. or they have gotten to the burnout point, And then as a way of extending their medical career, they have actually branched out into other things. And it is because of that, that allows for them to stay in a little longer. Do you think that's generational? Maybe. I don't know. I'm, I was born in 75 and like, uh, I have that feeling. <laughs> so I, I, don't, I, I don't know. And I know I the younger you, ones, the younger ones are definitely feeling that way. They're like, yeah, oh yeah, I, we're not doing this for uh, ever. <laughs> because part of what I also discuss is when should a physician retire who's in their seventies and older? Um, Got it. and, um, why don't we have, a, you know, pilots have a, an age limit. I think pilots have to retire by 60, actually. And, um, you know, obviously that's one small mistake is a really big mistake. But well, for us, um, it is too. <laughs> but for us, it is too. And, and I could Somebody's tell life. I retired at 65 because then I could get health insurance. Um, and, okay. um, and so that, that marker just worked for me. Um, and, um, and that was six years ago. So do the math. I'm coming 72 this year. Um, but I know doctors who have practiced much further than that and and should they, you know, I know that I'm not as sharp as I used to be. My memory's not as good as it used to be. Um, and that's just being honest. Um, and I'm not saying some people aren't competent. Could I still have been competent? Probably, probably not in teaching though. I was in residency education and yeah, yeah. You, be, you have to be absolutely on top of everything. You do. Uh, Cause they I, make it known. Even when you just come out, like literally as a, a new attending coming out of residency, I was like, ah! cause you get, yeah, you have to be on top of your game with the residents. There's no doubt about it. And, and it's like a constant thing. Um, and I, I could see, I could see how, you know, as you're getting up there, you know, you're like starting to feel like, uh, this is a little too much. This is a little too much, you know, um, I would say, cause I, cause I guess the corollary to that is, is it specialty dependent? Ah. Right. Because, okay. When I say that, I mean, like, for example, if you are in a specialty where there is not any patient contact, but you know, the vast knowledge that you have is going to be very helpful. All those years of experience are going to be very helpful. Like for example, um, clinical pathology, right? Mm -hmm. Like you could potentially do that for a long time. Right. I mean, I guess the, if your vision goes, I guess that would be a, a hindrance, but like, the, the fact is like, that is like pattern recognition that is knowing all those little details. That is all of that. So, you know, and could you do also, that longer? You know, maybe, I don't know. Cause there's also not a lot of new information. It's not like you have to be up with the newer drugs and what drugs just, if it, there's a new study right. that shows the drug has new side effects or there's right. we've changed the diagnosis or there's a new test or a new image or something like that, that you, you wouldn't have that same kind of pressure of constantly changing knowledge. I'm not saying pathology knowledge never changes, but the pace has got to be much more. It's a different, a different pace. And then I guess the other one I could think of would be, um, radiology, some aspects of radiology. Now I wouldn't say everything because obviously interventional radiology needs to be up on the latest, um, techniques and you have to have the dexterity involved there. 
Um, and then, but if you were just doing general radiology, I think that you probably would be good, right? I mean, mm -hmm. what changes happen, maybe, you know, there are some more, there's like more, um, more detail that's, that's now observed depending on how, how low we get or how, I guess, not how low we get with, yeah, how low we, how thin we get with the slices of the topographies or, you know, um, any of the other kind of radiographic tests. But I think that would be pretty much what you'd have to, and that's also pattern recognition. So if right. you have a lot of, if you have thousands and thousands of patterns in your head, like when you see it, you're gonna be like, oh yeah, that's such and such, like right away. So years of experience, would be an asset there. I, no, but I again, it's, it's vision, but again, it's vision too, right? I mean, it's the same thing. So, um, but yeah, I mean, those are the two ones I can think of that you could really, and then I guess when people think about, you know, transitioning out of medicine as you get older, maybe, you know, so I think that the clinical piece is, is the hardest, right? Like, you, you kind of have to like, know when, like, for example, in my specialty, I could not possibly see myself being in, being in my sixties, doing this job. Like, I, I think it's, I think it's just not fair to myself. It wouldn't be fair to me. <laughs> I just couldn't see myself, you know, 12 hour shifts, like just pounding it out, like, you know, month after month, I, I, I just couldn't see it. Right. Um, but I could see myself, as 60 something years, you know, on a medical board or on a, like, or on, you know, if I'm like an oncologist on tumor board, you know, looking at mm -hmm. cases and, and giving advice. So, you know, I think it's, it's very dependent <laughs> and variable, which makes it really complicated mm -hmm. because we, we, it's obvious in things that are physically demanding you know, orthopedic surgery or surgery in general, like, you know, or, um, emergency medicine or, um, primary care where you're like constantly having to keep up with all of the side effects, like you mentioned of all the drugs. And there's so many new drugs that come out. It's like a constant thing. Um, I think the cognitive load of that is just very overwhelming. It's overwhelming for even young people. So I can't imagine that as my brain ages that I would be able to keep up with it as well as I did when I first came out of residency. I just, I just couldn't imagine that. So yeah, I don't know. Should we have an age? I don't know if we should have an age. It's a tough question, right? Because, because there are things that you could still do. Yeah, but there's no what you choose to do, right? No, yeah, there's no good tests, even for the cognitive ability of a physician. There's, there's no accepted test you know, each specialty would be different. And, and so it's, it's a huge difficulty to try to figure out a way to judge competence. You know, they've tried it with board exams and, uh, you know, repeating your board exams, but that's, I don't know if that's ever been proven that it makes a huge difference. Agreed. It's kind of like a driver's test, right? It's kind of like, okay, well, when should you not drive anymore? You know, if you're 85 years old and you are a farmer and you have been slinging hay stacks and, you know, do all this stuff and you're perfectly great shape and health, you know, should you still be driving on a road at 85? Like, should it be a number? No, you know, it's hard. But then you take a test and you're fine. You know what I mean? Or you could be somebody who can pass the test and you shouldn't really be driving. So I, I don't know. It, it's, a tough, ask, it's a tough you know? thing. I asked myself, would I want to go to a physician who's my age and um, at almost 72? And I'm not sure I would. Oh, interesting. I, See, that's I think interesting. I would rather go to a younger physician. And I do. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know? no, 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 these are good questions. I, I honestly, before our conversation today, had not even thought about it. Um, so that it's, it's interesting. It's definitely interesting um, because it's like, it's so it's almost like if we are to say that, that, you know, okay, well, this is not something that I would do, or I wouldn't see this person. It's almost like we should be thinking about, well, how do you help that person to transition to something else? Because I don't know, I can only speak for 
my generation. I don't know like what the generations before me experience and how they view medicine. Because for me, you know, I learned very early on not to make medicine define me and not to be just Dr. Gregory, right? Like I learned that early on because I saw people's lives fall apart when that's all they did, when they were just doctor. And if they got an injury or if there's something that occurred that prevented them from doing it anymore, they totally like were on the brink of suicide, like that bad. And so I don't know generationally, like how it's viewed, you know, I think, I think that would impact things. Yeah. I think there are always those physicians and these people that they're the ones who this is all they ever wanted to do. It's been their dream since childhood. If they couldn't have gotten into medical school, they would have been devastated and crushed and would have tried over and over again. And it's the only path that they see. And I loved what you just said, because it it brings up my favorite quote from one of my favorite poets, who's Walt Whitman. And uh, he has this poem called Song of Myself. And in it, my favorite line is, I am large, I contain multitudes. Oh, and nice. and that was within each one of us, there are many people um, that we could be. And like when I was in college, I was contemplating four career choices. And um, my major was creative writing. And uh, who goes into medicine with that? Um, uh, I never but it's such, it goes in handy, though, doesn't it? Well, it does now. <laughs> right. <laughs> It does now, 40 years later. Um, but that skin was underneath my medicine skin the whole time. And I didn't even realize it. I, my plan had not really been to launch a bunch of novels upon retirement. I thought I'd do some writing. But um, when I kind of molted off the, the doctor skin and found this writer skin underneath, I'd like, I don't like this. And nice. um and even before I had a publisher back when I was still self-publishing and couldn't get an agent. And I mean, you, you put up a, with a lot of rejection in, in the writing world. And, um, but even then I looked at myself and was I having a good time, even though I was falling down with the endeavor for sure. Um, and I said, you know what, I'm having too much fun. And, and I was learning, I could see as I was going that I was getting better. And, nice. um, and, and that, that my craft and my skills were getting better and I got help, you know, and, and nobody, nobody does this in the world alone, hardly. And, and, you know, and I studied on it and I, and I got helps of, of some editors and all, and, and you could just see my skills getting better. Um, but I almost went into paleontology. I was also an anthropology oh, interesting. Man, and I came oh, yeah. this close into going into paleontology, but it's a good thing that I didn't because I was. I was very introverted, very shy okay. in college. Yeah, yeah. And if I had gone into a field like that, mm-hmm. I think I never would have developed much social skills. I would have been okay. happy. I would have yes. been happy <laughs> in the dusty back rooms and out on the digs and, you know, with my little brush. And I would have, I think I would have loved it. I think it would have been right. a good good thing for me to do because I'm fascinated by time and evolution and but um I'm not sure I would have been a different person medicine medicine grew me up in a social way that I did not have those skills before but as you know when you are talking to patients about their most intimate functions um you can't just stay in a shell um you know and uh and it also brings you outside of yourself because you're focusing on the patient. You're focusing on somebody else. You don't yes, have time to yes. think about yourself. And if you're uncomfortable or not, you got to take care of them. And, right. Right. Um, yes. And so it was, it was a very good, good for me to stretch myself. And it's a good thing that I ended up in medicine just from being a more social person and more functional in in our social world. Nice. Nice. Hey, it's Dr. G. And I just wanted to take a quick moment to thank you for listening to this episode. I'm so honored to have you here with me. Did you know that I can help you to get your own podcast started? With my podcasting launch course for professionals, I walk you through everything you need to know about starting a podcast. I'm with you every step of the way from sign up to launching your show with five episodes ready to go. There's a done for you version that's also available. If you would just rather 
just do recordings and leave the behind the scenes work up to us, then that one is definitely for you. But either way, we've got your back here at Fearless Freedom with Dr. G. Oh, if you already have a show and you need production services, we have monthly plans available for you. So check out the links in the episode show notes for more information. Let's get back to the show. And, you know, um, in our conversation, I have uh, noticed that you faced several fears, even though you didn't say them. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. It sounds like there are many, many, many opportunities there to face them. So, you know, from the moments when you made the transition out of medicine, I'm sure there was some fear there because you're leaving familiar for unfamiliar, right? Uh, and then to the point where you actually like, Shed, you shedded the exoskeleton of medicine and then you you revealed you know the inner you of creative writing um and then decided that you was going you were going to write um and then you self-published and then you were trying to get an agent they had to be some fear associated with that because you're hearing no right you just mentioned oh, that you yeah. you just kept on going even though you were hearing no so there had to be fear associated with well why is nobody taking on my work does this mean that my work is not good is you know what i mean all those questions and then the um and then the fear that probably comes along with every single time that you release that you've completed a project and you're about to release that into the world, world. are people going to like it? You know, all of those things, you know, so yeah. you touched on a lot of different uh, areas where there could potentially be fear. How did you manage to have the resilience to keep going, even when you were met with knows? I think that a lot of it is just, I looked at it as an adventure. For one yeah. thing, I didn't have to, I didn't have to do it. It wasn't my livelihood didn't depend on it. Um, and the fact is, I think I saw less than 2%, maybe 1% of writers of authors actually make a living at writing. It's not, a, I'm not talking about journalists and people who are employed, um, but more people who are writing on their own. And so, you, you don't, you're not going to rise into that world, most likely. It's it's a very ethereal place to be, to actually be making a lot of money on books. You have to sell thousands, tens of thousands of books, you know, to get into that range. And so that mostly means you have to be famous, you know, gotcha. or already well-established. And you're not going to get well-established when you start this at almost 70. Um, maybe if I started at 40, you know, I could have built up that establishment, but I didn't have time then. And I was raising right, a daughter right. and, yes. and that this, that's not going to happen. Uh, writing takes time. It, you spend, a, it's a very solitary pursuit. You spend a lot of time by yourself. Luckily, I'm very comfortable with that. I enjoy that. Um, and uh, I like being alone. So, so that helps, but I just had to reevaluate. Well, everybody's saying no, but I'm also getting a little bit of positive feedback from some of the people I've worked with. And some of the okay. people read the novels. And so there was enough, there was enough of that little bit and my inner voice saying, nobody's done this, this is fun. Um, but what, it, what are the negatives that I'm getting and why am I not getting response? And you try to shift, you try to listen. Some of the negatives are just, they don't understand. And then you realize that publishing, they actually don't necessarily want to try a new concept. They're not sure it will sell. Uh, um, yeah. and, uh, and they're so afraid. They're afraid. <laughs> they're, too. Fear. They're, they're in a business. And right. so, uh, so that makes it very different for them. They have to take on projects that they're pretty sure they can sell. And, um, and so when it's an unknown author, an unknown concept, um, they're like, well, this is kind of interesting, but no thanks. And uh, it was actually my third novel in the Grand Canyon books that I, because they were getting better, I think. And then I got the interest of the publisher and a university publisher also doesn't usually require an agent. So you can oh, nice. apply to them directly without an agent. So you don't have to have that person who's convinced they can sell. Got it. Your book. Got it. So that is also helpful. Um, but there's a very limited amount of fiction that a university press will consider also. Sure. Sure. And, um, and I'm, I'm very grateful 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it sounds like a nice marriage. And so, yeah, you know, he, yeah, no, go ahead. Sorry. No, I just said for, for that, they somehow saw my vision. No, it's great. That is great. And, you know, like, and um, people who listen to the show know this about me, but like, I am very much like my brain is like going different, all different directions at once. <laughs> and so every time you say Grand Canyon, I remember. So our children were homeschooled for a long, long time. Like they literally just went to school for the first time when we moved here. Um, but uh, one of the things that they studied was um, extremes of climate. And one of the areas that, that they looked at was the bottom of the Grand Canyon, mm-hmm. which is where the Hasapi people live. Oh, and um, you- yeah. Yeah. Did, I, did I say it wrong? I'm sure I did. I'm sure I said yeah. it wrong. How do you have say a, it? Have a soup eye. Have a soup eye. Thank you. So where to have a soup I live, right? And I just remember when we're looking at that, you know, they're agrarian, which I thought was fascinating. Um, and so they are not easily accessed because they're at the bottom of the canyon. That's right. And so I was wondering, as you're saying that, I was like, wait, is her character down there with them? Or where oh. is the character? You know what I mean? Like, where are they practicing? Because I'm just wondering, well, that's pretty cool if they're actually down there, because that's even more uh, another layer on top of that because of, right. you know, access issues and uh, um, the fact that, you know, that individual truly would be everything as far as like, you know, delivering babies and like, you know, the surgeries and like doing everything because of access so, uh, yeah, I'm curious. So, so I'm, I'm sorry, but that just came into my head and I was like, you know what? I've been meaning to ask. I just need to ask that question. <laughs> yeah, so, well, the, the clinic at the Grand Canyon, which is in the National Park, right in the village where all the visitors come. I um, see. And, and so it's and it's on the edge of this, pretty near the edge of the South Rim there. Havasupai okay. is um, further west and, um, and you and it was like the bottom of the Grand Canyon everywhere. There's no roads. To go down there so you can hike in you can ride a mule or a horse in or you can ride a helicopter in you can get there but this is not a normal way to go you can float down the river until you get to the river that comes out of Havasupe and okay. hike back up along along that creek but um but that would just be a tourist more of a tourist hiking sort of thing um but that's why once you leave the rim of the Grand Canyon, the national park part on the rim, once you start hiking down, you are very remote. You are away from everything. And um, that's why there are so many good stories. I knew a lot of doctors who worked at that clinic. And um, okay. it used to be one of the rotations for our residents where they would go there and spend Okay, month. It was considered nice. a, rural, a rural rotation because the, okay. closest, the closest real medical center and hospital was in Flagstaff, which is about 70 miles away. Wow. Um, and uh, so it, it's quite remote and you had to have a lot of skills there. And so it was ideal for family physicians because there were kids and, you know, there was everything. But, you know, obviously you couldn't do any major surgeries. Right, there. right. They would, all right. Be, they would all be transported. So there's a lot of those cases that occur at the Grand Canyon, a lot of heat injury, a lot of, you know, injuries. Um, and uh, if you're really interested in all this, there's this wonderful book written by um, a friend of mine who's been a doctor at the South Rim for many years. His name is Tom Myers. And he co-wrote a book called Over the Edge, Death in Grand Canyon. Wow. And it is organized chapter by chapter by the method of death. And it chronicles- Oh, wow. Okay, so now you got me looking this up. (laughs) Tom Meyer. So T-O-M Meyer. And Meyer Meyer. is- um, Meyer is M-E- Oh, M-Y-E. And like one chapter is about drownings. One chapter is about falls. One chapter okay. is about lightning strikes or heat injury. And, um, and just, it's, it's a fascinating book. And now that, that, that's nonfiction, you know, but he chronicles okay. it all. It's, it's just, uh, he wrote it with another man who is a river runner. Uh, suicide. Oh, a, interesting. There's a huge chapter on suicides. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, I could see people would want to do that there. Jeez. Yeah, well, and Thelma, the movie Thelma and Louise didn't do the canyon any favors um, because there were some uh, lookalike suicides oh, man. after that movie came out. And that, that was pretended wow. at the Grand Canyon, but it wasn't filmed at the Grand Canyon. It was actually filmed in Utah. 
Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. Don't yeah. Put, no. Don't, don't put me on that, but I'm pretty sure. No, 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 no. That is, that's fine. Yeah. No, I, uh, that's, that's, yeah. So I think I'll look at this for sure. Awesome. Well, you know what? You know what? You have got to let people know how they can reach out to you, how they can. I know the books are available on the different booksellers, um, but do you have a website that you want to share? I do. I do. Okay. It's um, the, um, the sign up for it is www.skepticalword, all lowercase. You can see okay. I'm, a, I'm a cynic at heart. So it's <laughs> skepticalword.com. Or you can just Google Sandra Cavallo Miller. Cavallo is my husband's name. Um, okay. Because there are about 3,000 Sandra Millers. Uh, oh, okay. Who write books. And so <laughs> my, my name is too common. So my pen name includes my husband's name, Cavallo, which uh, actually is Italian Spanish for horse, which um, I'm a big Oh, nice. Fan. That worked out. Yeah. And, awesome. uh, and, and if anyone wants to write to me, there's a link there on my website where um, you can write to me. And I'd love to encourage people to write, especially physicians, to write about their experiences, to try your hand of fiction. Just, you know, like I said, take the, your worst patient or your worst colleague or something and write something fictional about them. It's really fun. <laughs> and, um, or the best one, if you want to write something inspirational. Um, yeah, yeah, but most yeah. people, there's rarely somebody who's all bad or all good. We're That's all true. Mix. There's there's a little of everything in everybody. There's a little yeah. of everything and everybody is a mix. And even some of yes. the worst people have glimmers of goodness in them. And even yes. some of the best people have glimmers of badness in them. So oh, of course, yeah. um, you know, that's, that's all part of the human condition. And, um, and so if anyone wants to communicate with me about their writing, I love that. Awesome. I used to run some fiction workshops for, um, for physicians, but that was before COVID. And oh, okay. kind of, yeah. that's kind of fallen by the wayside for now. I'm hoping to start it back up. Hopefully that starts back up again. That'd be great. Oh, that would be great. Yeah. Oh, awesome. 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 Wow. You have quite a few here. Wow. I'm so excited for you. That's good. <laughs> uh, the color of rock where the light, where the light, light goes. Light comes and goes. That's where the that's light the comes middle, and goes. Yeah, that's the middle one of the Grand Canyon books. And it actually mostly takes place in Yellowstone, which is another one of my favorite places. Um, I that when Mount St. Helens erupted, um, I got very interested in volcanology. And I now consider myself an amateur volcanologist. Oh, nice. I read everything I can about volcanoes. So they're just fascinating to me. And, uh, and of course, Yellowstone is the biggest super volcano on the planet. So we yeah, just hope yeah. that it stays quiet. Oh, yeah. This does not, uh, let's not have that guy erupt. Let's, let's not. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. Oh, There's, my gosh. They don't oh think gosh. it's going to erupt anytime soon. Got it. At least not in, in our even generations beh behind us, uh, life, life's tough lifespan. Yeah. Yeah, we, awesome. we say that and then watch next month, it'll happen. Oh, know? no, 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 put that out in the universe. No, 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 absolutely not. Absolutely not. Awesome. You know what? Let us do our tradition at this point. Okay. Um, uh, it is the fill in the blanks. Are you right, ready? Right. You ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. All right. All right. Fantastic. All right. So the first one is if I am fearless, I will. Um, I will not get derailed by negative feedback. Uh, I will consider it and I will analyze it and see if I see any validity in it. And if I do, and I think there's a kernel of truth in it, then I will try to embrace that and, and shift myself in that. But there's, um, but at some point, if I'm having fun, if what I'm doing feels right, and I'm not hurting anyone, then I'm not gonna let that derail me. Um, and I have to look down to my core of what I'm doing and, and, and see if there might, often there can be a little tiny kernel of truth to negative feedback. Um, and, uh, you know, when somebody reads something of mine they say like, oh, that just didn't work for me. Well, that means maybe it won't work for someone else too. It's, it's their, their feedback is, is still valid. It didn't, they didn't like it. And, and then I wanna know why. And maybe it just doesn't satisfy something or maybe they don't understand it, you know? So, but, you know, I try to analyze everything. So just to not, not let it derail you. And um, because, um, you know, 
every journey may be a little bit different than you thought it was going to be at the beginning. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, that's, that's great. Um, you just got me thinking too. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. The next one is if I am fearless, I will. No, no I'm sorry. To me, fearless freedom means um, that if you fall down, you don't necessarily quit unless you look at, it's kind of a, the same thing in a way, because you won't necessarily quit as long as it, it looks like there's promise. So if I fall down or if I stumble, I'm going to see what did I trip on? You know, is that something that I can fix if it's not fixable? But I also think, think that there's fearless freedom in recognizing when you're hitting your head against the wall. Absolutely. That maybe, Absolutely. That maybe it doesn't fit. And to go on stubbornly insisting on trying to push yourself as a round peg into a square hole, you know, stepping back and reassessing is not the same thing as giving up. That is a way of moving on with new information and, and that you may need to shift. That's one of the reasons why I decided to get away from the Grand Canyon novels and try the public health novel because Got I it. thought, I, 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 I've done pretty well with these, but I'm not feeling the drive anymore. Got it. And um, I felt like I'd done a lot with those characters and I wasn't sure I could keep, could sustain that for another one. And that's why I decided to get new characters, the public health thing. There's some public health physicians here who I just adore and admire so much. Awesome. And, awesome. and I wanted to represent what that life was like to people mm -hmm. before COVID. Um, right, 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 right. <laughs> It's a whole different animal now, but you are absolutely right. No, that's great. And then the, the last item is uh, my battle cry is. Oh, keep exploring. The, like I said, the rewards may be different than what you really thought, but you just never know what, when you turn over that next rock, what you're going to see. I was writing about a character um, in the book that's coming out next year, um, the male who actually is a radiologist, the, one of the male characters, and, he's, and he decides to take up archery as a sport. Okay. And I used to do a little bit of archery when I was a kid. And I thought like, well, I should go take a few archery lessons, see if the equipment has changed, it's changed a lot. Um, <laughs> so I just contacted this archery club nearby. I set up some lessons. I go and I've got this great young woman who's my archery teacher. I took about four lessons and um, she was nice. She was a good teacher. And uh, as I'm getting ready to go home after the first lesson, I was asking her about herself. And turns out she's a competitive, an internationally competitive um, target archer with a compound bow. Not only just internationally competitive, at the time of that lesson, she was ranked number one in the world. Holy so smokes. here I am, <laughs> old woman, <laughs> makes an archery lesson and ends up with the top, one of the top archers in the world. I mean, you just never That's know. Amazing. That's this amazing. That's amazing. I just love that story. Her name is Alexis Ruiz. I just love her. Oh, wow. That <laughs> is I fantastic. Her, yeah, I told her right off the bat what my goals were for the lessons were because I was writing about a character and I probably yeah. wasn't trying to become a great archer or anything. I just wanted to be familiar with the language. And, nice, uh, nice, 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 nice. It's an accomplished, but, but what a treat to yeah, find yes, yes. yourself with with such a star for no yes. good reason, just pure chance yeah yeah so that's what i mean by just turning over a rock and you know sometimes yeah. there's an ugly bug under it too and you go run screaming away like no no <laughs> you know but uh but it's just you know we only have so much time um yes. one of the questions on your questionnaire was like what do you fear and right now what i fear mm -hmm. is time you know, yeah. I mean, I'm at that age where anything can happen. I could develop cancer. I could have a stroke or a heart attack. You know, I'm in my seventies. And, um, and so I just feel this clock ticking really loudly. And so I'm writing with like my hair is on fire. And so Got that's, it. that's my fear is either okay. I won't be able to write anymore because something could happen or, you know, but there's only one way to fight that. And that's be, do as much as I can. So that's right. That's right. No regrets. Not as fantastic. Love it. Oh my gosh. What a great conversation. <laughs> loved it. Loved it. Loved it. Loved it. Thank this you so, so much. For... What's that? I said, this is so much fun. Oh yeah. Thank there's a lot of fun. You. There's a lot of fun. This is why I podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I, um, I am so grateful that you took time out to spend with us here, the Fearless Freedom Tribe. And, um, thank you. 
Oh, thank you. It's been a real treat to talk with you. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Fearless Freedom with Dr. G. Again, I'm Dr. G. And if you like this episode, be sure to subscribe so that you can get notified of when the next episode is going to be. And also, I'll catch you next time. Have a great one. Be strong, be brave, and unleash your greatness.